a hymnal regarding that than probably anyone around the area. And then he's also woven into that some, uh, some newer songs that folks have written that celebrate this time of the year. Brother Norman Hare is right. Christmas certainly is a, is a day. It's an event. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas day. But it is, it is a mentality. It's a mindset. Christ has come. And there's a sense in which while the world will pay more attention to an event in history around Christmas time, unless, unless their hearts are just completely hardened and they, they, they grit their teeth when someone says, Merry Christmas. I don't know if you read, read the story about the woman who assaulted a person, uh, beat a person up because they ventured to say Merry Christmas. There are those folks out there like that. But, but by and large, good-willed people think more about the birth of Jesus this time of year. But we live in the light of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's always Christmas for us. He has come. And He's coming again. Well, we're heading into 2020. God willing, if He lets us live and gather back together next Sunday, January the 5th, we will enter a new year together. 2020, it's going to provide some opportunities for us to think about vision. Georgia, how are your eyes? Are you, are you seeing better now with both of your eyes? Not as quick. All right. So, but the first one dialed in, praying the second one will get dialed in. Well, see, the Lord wants that for every one of us spiritually. He wants every one of us to have 2020 vision. And we'll be talking about some of that as we head into 2020, God willing. Today we're wrapping up. I hope you can track with me. I know sometimes we do a series, then we do a, something, a series kind of within a series, and then, and then you may kind of lose where we are. So let me give you the picture of where we are. We've been preaching a series for several months now on uh, the one anothering. We turned it into a participle, one anothering, living in a gospel community. We started that series, you remember? And Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. We told you then he raised the bar. Seemed almost impossible to do, by the way, when you read the Old Testament that, that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus takes that in the New Testament, when he's asked what is the greatest commandment, he says, well, the greatest commandment is, and he cites that, the first, and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You say, well, how do you raise the bar on that? Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. So you, you're not diminishing the great commandment. You're... Uh, fleshing out the great commandment. You read it in the law. You hear Jesus affirm it, but you see his life and you see what that looks like. So we begin there. We've looked at different one another passages, and we'll be doing some more of that, by the way, when we head into, the, into 2020. We're going to set, some, set a table for some things early on in January, but we'll get back into the one anothering series. And so within that... As we approached Thanksgiving and Christmas, we begin looking at Ephesians 5, uh, verses 15 and following, which have a couple of one another expressions in that passage. So turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21, we're going to tie this up today. 5, 15 to 21. And when you found that, stand with me if you would. And if you don't have a Bible, don't have access to a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you. you I've said this for 15 years to you. I'm, I want you to see. I want you to hear. I want you to wrestle with the text. Not what I tell you the text says, what the text actually says. And so we put it in front of you in different means to make sure that you have access to the Word of God. There is no guarantee in the Bible that my words will not return void. 
There's no guarantee in the Bible that your words will not return void. But there is a guarantee in the Bible. When God says to the prophet, so shall my word be, which comes out of my mouth, it will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent forth. And when we read the Scripture, we're reading words that have come out of the very mouth of God. You follow along, if you will, as I read Ephesians 5, 15 to 21, focusing in on verse 21 today. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine. We looked at it at the text and we told you, it says, stop being drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but keep on being filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer is today that as we've come through the season, Arguably, the season that challenges covetousness, challenges stinginess, challenges selfishness more than any other season that we've come through intact, looking at the more noble ways to live out, have a spirit-filled Christmas. Thank you. Please be seated. So we looked initially on the 1st of December, walking wise in evil times suggesting to you that when you move into December, you come into a season of the year when, when you'll see the strangest things. You'll see grown women fighting one another over a toy on a Friday called Black Friday. Uh, strange. You'll see children pitch a fit because what they got as a gift, undeserved, is not what they wanted. They wanted something else. We talked to you about that as we were heading into that. Then on the 8th, we looked at, the, at what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, singing to one another. That corporate worship is about lifting our voices in praise to God, but we're also speaking to one another, teaching one another, admonishing one another, encouraging one another, using the medium of music. I remind you, Martin Luther said during the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, let the Pope's men write the theologies, I'll write the hymns. Not because he was down on theology, but because he understood if you write good theology and hymns, hymns stick to people. I can start humming and 90 to 95% of you will know you know immediately what I'm humming. That's the power of music. Karen and I grew up in the 60s. Every now and then on a radio station, a random radio station, an introduction to a song will come on out of that era. And immediately on the on the PowerPoint slides of my mind, the lyrics are there. It's powerful. Singing to one another. Also, singing to the Lord, because the text goes on to say that, that the way we sing to one another is because we're singing and making merry in our hearts to the Lord. And then, and then in that climate, a climate, a spirit-filled climate where you, where you recognize the value, the propriety, the importance of singing to one another, flowing out of a heart, singing to the Lord, an attitude of thanksgiving. A right attitude of thanksgiving leads to thanks living or thankful living. And then today, submitting to one another. One of the marks of a real follower of Christ, submitting to one another. It shouldn't strike any of you as strange that you live in a society where people say, who are you? You're not the boss of me. Nobody's going to tell me what I'm going to do. I'm my own person. You just hear it's endless. It's endless. It comes out of the garden, of course. Our first parents sinned, rebelled against God. 
Psalm 2 crystallizes that we will not have this one to rule over us. Let us cast the yoke off of us. And into that mentality comes Jesus Christ. King of kings and Lord of lords, and yet He did not display Himself that way when He entered this world. He came through the birth process born to a young woman, a teenage girl, placed in very humble beginnings. If you had looked, if you'd been there and gazed upon Him in the stable, in the manger, on the hay, and you wanted to believe this was God's Messiah, you would have cried out, Oh God, I believe, but help my unbelief. The beginnings were so humble. And He comes. And we read Philippians 2 together. He emptied Himself of divine prerogatives. He emptied His seat at the right hand of the Father to come in the likeness of human flesh. Born to a little nobody girl with a nobody dad to raise him and watch over him. Coming out of a town that was had such a bad reputation that the joke was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He showed us by the Incarnation what He would call us to be. The night that He was betrayed, He took a water basin and a towel. The rabbi, whether they understood the full implications of His rabbinic role or not, a rabbi never washed the feet of His disciples. And he washed them that night. And he said, you call me teacher. And you are right because I am. And if I, your teacher, wash your feet, how much more should you wash one another's feet? And blessed are you when you do this. He made a beatitude out of one of the most servant expressions in the, in the arrangement, the social order of that day. So Paul says, keep on being filled with the Spirit. Live a Spirit-filled life. A life where you recognize the importance of gathering together. You see, you cannot sing to one another if you don't ever get together with one another. But if you sing unto the Lord, a heart made merry by the Lord, you can't help but want to be with one another. You can't help it. The psalmist, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Too many professing Christians in America today say, oh my goodness, it's Sunday again already. That's, that's, that's not even on the same planet as I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's a heart made glad by the Lord. And a heart made glad by the Lord recognizes the reasons we have to give thanks. The world's rich would like to be America's poor. Because of the blessings that accrue in this place. Thanksgiving. When you, when you pull all that together and those attitudes are welling up in us, then submission. You recognize who you are. I think it's Louis Giglio who says, I, I know, I know I am and I am not Him. <laughs> Playing off the idea of the I am. We know who we are. We know who God is. And we know how He's called us to manifest the Gospel in a world full of itself. We don't need arrogant, haughty, high-minded, Messiah complex people trying to win the world to Jesus. We need foot washers. So I want you to see how this text for just a few minutes this morning 
before we continue singing. Remember, we're having the lesson, and then we're going to have the lab. Josh is going to come back and lead us in singing some more. First of all, the manner of spirit-filled relationships, and then second, the motive for spirit-filled relationships. Just in this verse 21, the manner of spirit-filled relationships and then the motive for spirit-filled relationships. Verse 21 simply says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the manner of spirit-filled relationships is this first part of the verse, submitting to one another. Mutual submission. When we went through Ephesians several years ago, I pointed out to you that this verse, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, launches Ephesians 5, 22 down through 6, where he, where he shows us what mutual submission looks like. And I pointed out then that when you read verse 22 in the Greek text, here's what it says. Wives unto your husbands as unto the Lord. And so wait a minute, preacher. I was just reading my Bible when you said that. He left out a word. The word submit is not in that verse 22. It's in verse 21. It, verse 21 drives the whole expression of relationships. Wives to husbands. Husbands to wives. Children to parents. Parents to children. It was pointed out by one commentator I was reading this week that Paul could have addressed the issue of submission by looking at the church where, where people are called upon to submit to their, to their leaders as unto the Lord. Or to the government where we're called upon. But he, he took, he said, the most the most tender, most vital, in fact, the original societal unit. Remember, remember, before there was anything called a church, there was the family. Before there was anything recognizable as government, there was the family. It is the seminal unit. And it's in this unit that we learn to practice mutual submission. It's where a dad... A husband who knows biblically he has authority demonstrates that tender servant leadership authority. He washes his wife with the word. He raises his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I remember years ago, I was doing some marriage counseling decades ago now. I've been here 15 years, so it's so it wasn't here, all right? Talking to a husband in a marriage counseling situation. And he suddenly slammed his fist on the table. She will not submit to me. I seized the opportunity <laughs> to teach him that whatever his idea of submission was, he needed to send that back to hell where it came from because you don't pound your fist on the table demanding that people submit to you. This is the Scripture teaching completely. Mutual submission. Paul said it this way in Romans 12, 10, Love one another with brotherly affection. We looked at this. It was one of the one another's we looked at. Outdo one another in showing honor. It, it, it could turn into a, uh, in a, in a silly expression where you're standing at a door. You open the door. You first. No, no, you first. No, no, I insist. You first. No, no, you go first. No, you. And you would say, well, that's silly. But it really is a, a way to demonstrate, no, I want to esteem you. I want to bless you. You see, what, what do you find in the church today? What do you find in too many places in America? Not the rest of the world so much because they're just trying to keep them getting killed in the rest of the world. But in the church in America today, it's, uh, well, nobody's blessing me. What about me? My. Mine. I. 
That must be in an apocryphal book or a pseudopigraphal book because it's not one of the books 66 of the, New, of the Scripture. It's one another. It's one another. It's not who's blessing me. It's who am I blessing. This mutual submission gets at the heart of it. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Remember, we read Philippians 2. Jesus could have rightly said, you know, this, this plan here. I mean, I am the second person of the Trinity, after all. Um, and, and you want me to go be born a baby? Angels adore me. In fact, they adore me so much that if I do this, they're just going to burst out of heaven and come down and adore me. They can't, cut, they can't help me. He didn't do that. The text tells us, though himself equal with God, did not cling to that, but willingly made himself of no reputation. Submission. The filling and control of the Holy Spirit in our lives will lead us to a spirit of humility, to the spirit that gives us the desire to seek the well-being of others before our own and to look for opportunities to be submissive to them. In other words, to wash their feet. Some of you will remember one of the first Sunday nights I was here in September 2005. That's what we did. We handed out towels to our deacons with Bethel's servant embroidered on them. And I said, let's wash the people's feet. We've never really gotten away from that mentality. Scripture calls on us over and over as Christians to be humble and submissive people. Paul is suggesting here that the Spirit-filled life is not a fight for the top. It's a fight for the bottom. It's what Jesus said in Mark 9.35. He sat down and called the twelve. And He said to them, If anyone would be first... He must be last of all and servant of all. Willing to follow. Willing to be led. Willing to be taught. Luke 18, 14. I tell you, as Jesus is wrapping up the story of the, of the, uh, of the Pharisee and the tax collector, Pharisee prayed, oh God, you've been so good to me. In fact, I'm so grateful I am who I am and I'm not this tax collector over here. I know you could have made me that. Oh, thank you. Tax collector can't even lift his eyes up. Beats himself on his chest. He's, it's, like the, it's like the pain of his sin is trying to, it's just it's throbbing and throbbing. Oh, Lord, mercy me, the sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the principle of submission should govern our relationships in the body of Christ. Every individual submitting to everyone else. What would it look like? Saturday night, getting ready to go to bed. How can, I, how can I bless my brothers tomorrow, my sisters tomorrow? How can I demonstrate a, an attitude of gratitude to God? How can I show them what faithfulness looks like and, and in doing so provoke them to love and good works? Submitting to one another. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 5 and 6, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God, this, this ought to just cause us to tremble. God opposes the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. The word opposes there is the word declares war. God declares war. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The, the, the person who wants to know how can, I, how can I bless others today? How can I wash the feet of my brothers and sisters today? Grace, just the portals of grace open up to such a person. Humble yourselves, therefore, here's the conclusion, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. He may lift you up to, to do something significant with you. But that comes through, uh, not like the woman years ago came up to me and they were, she said, I think, you know, my husband, he's really skilled. You need to use him in, in this, that, and the other. Well, Show that you can follow. Show that you can serve. I preached what became a famous sermon at First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana, when people were jockeying for the position of deacon because you, if you became a deacon at First Baptist Church at that time, then if you ran for office, it was kind of a feather in your crown. And so I preached a message around election time when it just so happened we were also considering assign, electing new deacons. We will crown no more deacons in this church. You don't elect a person a deacon hoping that he will begin to serve. You elect a person a deacon because he is a servant. He's shown a heart to serve. This word uh, that we looked at, the submit, it's a compound word. It means to line up under someone, an entity. It means to line up under in this place, it means to line up under the lordship of Christ. If this is Jesus Christ's church, and I believe it is, then you should be concerned to know what Jesus Christ wants from his church, and you should be absolutely willing to give yourself to see that that comes to pass. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Jesus asks in the Gospels. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things, that is, practice the things I've commanded you to do? He warns in Matthew 7 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, don't you remember we did this and this? In fact, I've taught, you through, taught through that before with you. The text there is so striking. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who practices the will of my Father in heaven. All right? And he says, many will say to me in that day, in your name we did this. In your name we did this. In your name. We were doing it in the name of God. I pointed out to the time when we went through that. You can do things in the name of God that are not done to the glory of God. And what we ought to be interested in is are we living to the glory of God? It is, after all, the reason He made you. If you don't believe that, ask your children. Who made you? God made me, they'll tell you. Well, what else did God make? Well, God made all things. They'll also tell you that. Well, why did God make you in all things? For His own glory. How do you glorify God? By loving Him and practicing or doing what He commands. Well, why should you glorify God? Because He made me and takes care of me. Advance up to the shorter catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Or as John Piper says, to glorify God by enjoying Him now and forever. This is basic. It's fundamental. So as we read in Philippians a while ago, Verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, we don't, we don't just ignore our interests, but also to the interests of others. Or as 1 Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 21, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Remember that word? We've looked at this before as we went through 1 Peter some time back. 
It is the, it's literally the word, it's a compound word, writing under. You should be familiar with my analogy of this by now. I'm not very creative, but I am persistent. When you were in first grade, I had Mrs. Abbott in first grade. And I think at some point, Ms. Abbott made it her mission that I was going to learn to make my letters right or she was going to die at my desk helping me to make them right. The big chief tablets, remember those? I don't know if you can still get them, the big chief tablets. They had the, the line, the little dotted lines. The alphabet was across the border. A, round, down. Big A, we went through that. The whole alphabet. You copied, you traced the dotted ones first. Then when you got good enough at it, you, you ventured to go underneath that to freehand it. Remember that? Writing under. Jesus has left us an example so that you might follow in his steps. You know, it's, it's interesting. There was a movement not too long ago. What would Jesus do? There's a, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing to ask. But we don't have to wonder, really. He left us the example. I wonder if Jesus expects me. Well, what, what did he show you? Every now and then I bump into somebody and says, well, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm not really involved in church much. But, you know, when the Spirit leads me, I say, why does the Spirit have to lead you to do something Jesus clearly commanded you should do? Aren't they one and the same? If you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, isn't the command the movement of the Spirit to do? Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. If that's why Jesus came and how Jesus came, then, then we, we will never, look, folks, I will never get out of servant, the role of a servant. Neither will you. Submitting to one another. And then finally, the motive. We'll wrap it up. The motive. Out of reverence for Christ. See, if it said sub submitting to one another because this is good for your spiritual growth, that's true. Submitting to one another because it can, it's a good way to make people feel better and to bless them, that's true. But our motivation is much higher than that. Do you love him? Is he worthy? Did he spare anything for you? Well, it settles it, doesn't it? Can we conclude that an attitude that says, I don't care, I, preacher, stop it. The submitting to one another sounds good. It just doesn't work in real life. Can we conclude that a person with such an attitude doesn't really have a God-given, Holy Spirit-birthed reverence for Jesus Christ? And can we work back into that and conclude rightly that a proper, spiritual, new birth, born again, Christ-following attitude of reverence for Jesus Christ will stir us to submitting to one another? Can we reverse engineer this and say it will stir us to a heart of thanksgiving? It will stir us to a heart made glad by the Lord. It will stir us to a people who take up their voices seize the opportunity to sing praise unto the Lord. And when that's the case, you have a Spirit-filled Christmas. But it shouldn't stop with Christmas. It should carry us all the way through. So how'd you do this past week? Christmas Day came upon us. Were you thankful? Were you glad? to bless others? Or did you get lost in the disappointment that you hadn't been blessed at the level you thought you deserved to be blessed? Don't miss an opportunity to live 
for Jesus Christ, a spirit-filled life. Let's pray. And Josh will come and lead us. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. And Oh, Lord, we know these things. We read them. We believe them at some level and grip them in our heads. We acknowledge them as true in your word. But, oh, dear God, we need your spirit to take these truths and perhaps in a way that hasn't happened in recent days or months or years, move them south and work them into the warp and woof of our hearts that we might be a people who live obvious, Spirit-filled lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.